So what is this crazy company? I'm the CEO of BioViva, and I'm very proud of it. So today we did hear a lot about it, great interventions, uh, things that you can do right now in your life that can change the way you feel today and the way you live and definitely how long you live within a natural lifespan. But my company is a gene therapy company. We want to modify your DNA. Why would we do that? What sort of evidence would we have that that works? Well, I'm going to walk through that in this conversation that I'm going to have with you, but I want to tell you how I got started. So I didn't just get started being a mad person who, who wanted to manipulate the people around me. My son was diagnosed with diabetes type 1 in 2013. And this was a real big blow to the family. Uh, it, it just was a painful experience to watch a nine-year-old, you know, go from a healthy, active life to a life of what seemed like multiple blood checks and insulin injections with every meal. You know, it, and it, it, was, it was very difficult in the hospital coming to terms with this. Then I looked around the hospital, and I saw kids that didn't have treatable diseases at least not with what they will use in medicine today. And yet I had read headlines that cancer had been cured, that we could differentiate cells to, to treat diabetes, that we could reverse dementia, all in mice. So I created a translational engine to bring that to the world, so that the people in the highest need could get access to new medicine, and potentially change the paradigm for the rest of us. So this is the World Health Organization's definition of health. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease and infirmary. There are very few people that can actually live up to this definition, and we would like to make sure that the World Health Organization stands behind us to bring you up to this much better condition. <laughs> so why would we do this? What is the need? Okay, so right now we're facing the silver tsunami. That means by the, the year of 2020, there'll be more people over the age of 65 than under the age of five. So what we're talking about doing with gene therapy is treating complex disease. So that includes things like diabetes, type 1 that children get in immunological diseases. But the greatest effort would be for biological aging. Believe it or not, many of these gene therapies are synonymous to both children and adults. So with this growing aging population, what we're seeing is less people under the age of 5 that go on to be the workforce and more people over the age of 65 that need care. Okay, so this is the tsunami, the crushing weight of the economic disaster of people getting older and not able to work. We call these trillion-dollar conundrums the diseases of aging. So each one of the diseases of aging, the major killers on the planet now, worldwide, globally, are about a trillion dollars, and that's growing exponentially as we go. This is a big catastrophe. So when you think about these type of health care, um, we think about a growing economic situation that we can't afford with less people going into the workforce and therefore actually curing these diseases or at least prolonging healthy lifespans saves us loads of money. So we're just going to look back historically so we can see what science has brought to you so far. So these are the causes of death in 1900, and you'll see that predominantly we died of infectious disease. The big game changers were antibiotics and immunizations, workplace safety, and sanitation. Antibiotics and immunizations being one of the biggest builds on this um, change in paradigm, which we can now see here, only about 3% of the population die of infectious disease. So that's actually massive innovation, and, and I, I, it's been quoted that, you know, anything past the year of 50 has been brought, brought to you by science. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's very evident. But if we look at these other diseases now, we see that we live longer, but we suffer for a longer period of time as well. And if we took these to heart as if they were an infectious disease, we would have a big call to arms. As a matter of fact, over 100,000 people will die today of biological aging. 
each one of those persons might have been someone to step up to pioneer new medicine. Existing treatments are not effective, and I think we heard this over and over today, but actually looking at efficacy numbers is very important, especially when we're talking about new medicine that might seem very strange or scary to people. Genetic modification or gene therapy is actually very succinct technology. We look for a protein target that we're trying to hit, and that's the only thing we upregulate. When you're dealing with small molecules, you're essentially throwing something into the body, you're potentially damaging the liver, and you're looking for off-target effects. As a matter of fact, everything from these drugs are a side effect. So the side effect is hopefully you get some positive ones, <laughs> and then you're going to probably get several negative ones. And when we look at this list here, what's important to look at is some of the most widely prescribed drugs. Okay, so for oncology, let's look at one of the, the biggest risk situations where you really want a drug to work. The efficacy right now is 25%, and in the U.S., those come at about a $9,000 a day cost. And so it only works in about 25% of the patients, and it's only going to extend life a matter of weeks. These are not good drugs. Uh, let's look at another uh, disease of aging on here. Let's look at Alzheimer's. 30% efficacy rate, and you're guaranteed to die of the disease. The, this is not good medicine, and um, I think that it was a necessary step in the evolution of technology and science, but we're on to better things. And the sooner we accept that and, and become excited about that, I think that we will be a happier, longer-lived society, and I think that we can beat 100. So Robert Boyle was the modern, uh, founder of modern chemistry, and in 1662, you'll find out this was not a modern idea of, of housewives that get to sit around. <laughs> um, actually, he was hoping uh, that the scientific discoveries that he would like to have uh, happen in the world. One of them was the prolongation of life, uh, the recovery of youth, including hair and teeth, and the cure for diseases. Uh, we are still working on that, but we're working towards that. So these are not new ideas. These were some of the ideas from some of the most intelligent people in science in the past. So why do we think that we can do this now? Um, Abby Roy, Dr. Abby Roy pointed out a very good position of we really don't know how to mark the, biomark the biomarkers of aging. We really don't have good ways to gauge how old you are biologically right now besides visual impression. But science has, in fact, targeted the hallmarks of aging. So the hallmarks of aging are being vetted, and right now we have 10 of them, and this is where therapeutic intervention is going. So you can look at this. Uh, some of the things are genomic instability, telomere attrition, uh, loss of proteostasis, so that means your cells aren't making good proteins, they might not be reusing them, they might not be recycling them. Uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, stem cell exhaustion, extracellular uh, regulation itch issues, and altered intracellular communication. So these are some of the hallmarks of aging. Well, these are all the hallmarks of aging, but I didn't discuss all of them. And these are what are driving cells getting older, okay? And so knowing this gives us a vantage point to start from. And now, with gene therapies, we're actually intervening and reversing some of these processes. So what is gene therapy? Number one, what we do is we find the gene that we'd like to upregulate. Um, this gene, in the case, case of aging, essentially tackles one or more hallmarks of aging. Uh, we put that into a capsid delivery system, and it is then injected into your body. So this is what the future of medicine looks like. I know everyone doesn't like a jab, uh, but it's a lot more simplistic than open heart surgery and other things that we're, we're doing today that in the future will be quite barbaric or only needed in great trauma incidents. Uh, at this point, the therapeutic target goes in, the capsid delivers the gene to your cell, and you upregulate the protein that you're making. So 
what's exciting about gene therapy is instead of all of these off-target um, small molecules, we're actually just upregulating the protein that we're looking for. So we're not going to upregulate a protein that has a, a problem in your body, that, that makes your body sicker. We're going to only use the ones that, that do not make you sick. And as a matter of fact, there's eight cures for gene therapy right now in the pipeline, and two of them have been passed, and they're a one-time treatment for the life of the patient. The power of this is staggering. Boy in the bubble disease, severe combined immunodeficiency, has been cured. <coughs> Big news to some people with one little gene and one little treatment. These kids get back to an active life and have their whole lives ahead of them. So why do we think gene therapy will work? Let's look at mice. So here's a field mouse, and this field mouse lives from about six to eight months in the wild. That's it. He gets predated, he gets eaten, or he gets caught in one of your mouse traps. If you bring him into the lab, just by protecting him, giving him a safe environment, no predators and no mouse traps, he lives uh, 12 to 18 months. Now, this is something that we heard about today, not necessarily calorie restriction, but we heard about eating well, eating right, and exercising. And this is actually really, really impressive. This mouse is put on calorie restriction. It's only given the amount of nutrients that it really needs to be healthy, not overly thin, but healthy. It gets exercise regularly, and look at the increase in lifespan. 26 to 30 months. This is pretty fantastic. I mean, this definitely shows you that intervening in your lifestyle will make a difference. It's the number one thing that you can do now, despite what Abby said. <laughs> He's just counting. He just knows th the treatments are coming. He doesn't need to worry about it. Okay, so, but if you do one single gene optimization, gene therapy, one gene, add one gene, and this mouse lives to 60 months with no diet restrictions and no exercise regimen. This is a healthy mouse. As a matter of fact, since the 1970s, we have been expanding the lifespan of model organisms. We have expanded worms' life by 11 times. That's healthy, vigorous life. Flies by six times, mice by five times, a certain type of fish by four times, but not humans. Since 2012 to 2015, two of the gene therapies that we're looking to launch the company with have made big strides, big efforts, and big news. Telomerase gene therapy increased the lifespan of mice by 24%. It, uh, the myostatin gene therapy, I'm going to explain that later, in restored muscle mass and increased strength. Uh, Telomerase-inducing gene therapy showed benefit to neural cells, potentially helping Alzheimer's patients. And human skin was completely regenerated with telomerase induction. Worldwide clinical trials are going wild in gene and cell therapies. In 2016, we finished off with 804 actively uh, involved, and more are coming. That's a growth rate of 21% over a one-year period of time. More and more companies are getting involved in raising hundreds of millions of dollars for one-time cures, all in the realm, in general, of monogenic disease. We'd like to take the power of that technology and use it in complex disease. The biggest mortality risk is age. The biggest killer is aging. Cellular degeneration at the biological level is essentially running you into what will eventually be your diagnoses, regardless of what you eat and how you live your life. You can prolong it, but this is the way to potentially get around and cure it. So what are our ideal therapeutic requirements? Number one, we would like them to be safe in animals and humans. I'm sure you would too. <laughs> we would like to ha them to have efficacy, meaning that they actually work. Um, our uh, program is actually being designed to ensure that the therapeutics that we use work. Uh, we're a clinical application, so we don't 
put years and years into research. We don't put millions of dollars into research. We translate the medicine when we think it's ready for humans and have human clinical trials to prove both safety and efficacy. And if it does not work, we toss it out for the next one. Uh, we would like it to modulate several of the biomarkers or the, sorry, the hallmarks of aging. Okay, that will be a very important um, part of the therapy. If it can hit one, that's great. If it can hit three, that's even better. We'd like to have a preventive, preventative effect to aging. So we want to prevent uh, biological aging from happening to begin with. Um, we would at least like to slow it in these early years of the therapies. Regenerative effect. So in order to have the biggest impact, we can't just slow aging. We need to regenerate bodies. I know that a lot of my favorite people in the world are over 65, and we need to not only stop that aging process, but we need to reverse it and get these people back to being active and, um, and be able to work much longer uh, with, as, with these um, new uh, routes of wanting to live longer. We need to be active longer. So Ben Franklin also <laughs> was a proponent of longevity and in 1780 he wrote a, a, a note to a friend of his from France and he essentially in this quote says he thinks that he's been born about a thousand years too soon. He foresees a future when we are able to cure disease and not only cure disease but even that of old age. These, um, these thinkers were, made a very powerful impact and it's interesting to bring up their quotes even today. So what therapies would we launch our company with or will we launch our company with? There's two, one is telomerase induction gene therapy. So telomeres are, the, are at the ends of your chromosomes. So think of your chromosomes like this, and there's caps on the ends. And as your cells divide, the caps get shorter and shorter. Um, our telomerase induction actually lengthens the telomeres, uh, giving your cells more healthy divisions. The myostatin inhibitor, uh, this, what this is, so you know, it's a, it's a target protein and it targets myostatin and it blocks it so that you can develop muscle mass. So myostatin blocks your ability to gain muscle mass and as we get older, we actually become more frail. We lose muscle mass over time. So um, this would give you the opportunity to get back out there, run your stairs, play your tennis and do all the things you like later into life. I see that my time is really short. So how can we determine efficacy when humans are so long lived? So here in Guernsey, you live to an average age of about 84. That's a long time to wait. We look at model organisms and we see how they work and we're actually building the um, biomarkers of aging. Um, so this is a process, this is in process in scientific now that I know a lot of people thought were too complicated today, but in fact, uh, we're getting a, a, a handle on it and this data will be important in the future. I only am getting to this now. I know that I'm out of time, but really quick, I took the first two gene therapies that our company is launching on. I took a dual gene therapy against biological aging and um, it made a lot of news. Um, it was the first time in the world that, that uh, a body had embarked on treating this uh, what we consider a disease. And so really quick, I'm gonna go through uh, the, the, um, the benefits. So we saw the telomeres uh, lengthen by 600 base pairs. This is before and after of my leg muscles. We saw increased muscle mass and decreased intramuscular fat. We saw a six-fold reduction in C-reactive proteins, uh, low risk of cancer. It's basically based on low, moderate, or high, and so low is your, your best marker in these tests. Uh, we saw a 25% reduction in bl blood glucose levels, which in is probably the increased muscle and the decreased intramuscular fat. My HbA1Cs were excellent, and we had a 50% reduction in triglycerides, so better heart health. We didn't see any changes in the places that we feared to see changes, which was the liver, the brain, and the kidneys. So we're gearing up to do clinical trials now. We're basing ourselves all around the world. We'd love to come to Guernsey. And thank you for listening.